put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. But hey, if the video is just too long for you to watch, chances are I recorded a shorter version and the link will be in the description box. It's not an inferior video, it's merely a Cliff's Notes version of this very video. The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring, movie review. Frodo, a hobbit, inherits the Ring of Power, although he doesn't at first know that that's what it is, and his good friend, who he happens to be a wizard, Gandalf, advises him to take it away from the village of hobbits to determine what must be done with the ring. It is too dangerous to keep around. And along the way, Frodo meets a dwarf, Broody, I'm sorry, Vigo Mortensen, a human, and the elven archer, Le Legolas, I think, played by Orlando Bloom, who is surprisingly badass for a long-haired blonde. Actually, come to think of it, he probably decided on the haircut and the hair color, and then figured he should probably be able to defend himself, so he won't get bullied really hard. Anyway, he is rather badass. Both of those words have been used about Orlando Bloom many times, but this is one of the only times where they'll be combined quite like that. Anyway, yes, a dwarf, a human, and an elven archer. And no, this is not the beginning of the joke. It's the start of the Fellowship. And Frodo must fight to defend the world from the evil of the Dark Lord Sauron. The great evil, great meaning larger events, I use it in a pejorative sense. I should probably, right off the bat, let you know, I am not really a fan of fantasy. I am into mythology, and I am a lover of great film, and that's really where I enter into this. And I'm, I'm not going to be... I love these three movies on account of being an admirer of film, and they're quite simply incredibly well made. But yeah, I will be doing these... I did do research, don't worry. I will be doing these reviews as someone who isn't actually into fantasy, but just appreciates good storytelling and, yeah. Now, this is... There, there are so many fantastic qualities, it's difficult to tell where to start. The film has an ensemble cast, and pretty much everyone does really well. I did... I did already kind of make a joke at Viggo Mortensen's expense. I like him, and it's not just because he's a fellow Dane. In this, he does kind of just brood it up, and that's, that's more or less the extent. But he is cool, and you know, you, you do get into his character. You do want to see him succeed. He's, he's likable enough. But yeah, the entire cast is it does really well and most of them are quite appropriately cast as well. There are a few head scratching decisions. Now the dialogue is a pretty good balance between sort of old English, this you know, big kind of dialogue with, you know, metaphors and, yeah, different grammatical rules than we usually 
employee and the like. A good balance between that and it still being understandable. You don't have to sit there with you know a notepad. It's not like Shakespeare. Don't get me wrong. I love Shakespeare, but you know when you just it's easier to read Shakespeare than it is to watch something that is Shakespeare if you don't already know the what is supposed to be being said. The the locations are gorgeous. It's you know around New Zealand and yeah you can totally tell why they chose it. It is just fantastic scenery and there is a real sense, excuse me, of the uh, of the grand scope. You feel like they really are on a big journey. And the the effects are really, really good. It's a great blend of practical effects, including a lot of prosthetics. The orcs are really impressive looking. They're you basically know that it's human beings under there, but man, you, you really can't see where the the prosthetics end and the human being begins. It's they they genuinely look inhuman. They look monstrous, and yet there is a wide they they have a, a lot of expression to them. And, uh, yeah, so it's practical effects and CGI. Now, the CGI is not quite perfect. You can still a little bit tell when something is animated in this. I would say they, you know, it's basically the technology, where it was at this point, which was very close to perfect, but not quite there. And it does get better in 2 and 3. And the integration is very convincing where you can't particularly tell where the real, you know, the, the real elements, the live action elements, and, and the CGI takes over. And the, the scale between the different races is actually a really good example of how compelling the effects are, because as you might know if you're into fantasy, I sort of knew hobbits are shorter than human beings, and there are a lot of scenes in this where, you know, we have several hobbits in the main cast, so, and as mentioned before, also a human being, so there's going to be a lot of scenes where they have to be in the same shot, and you want a convincing effect to, yeah, to convey that they're not the same height. These are not the same, they're, they're not the same race. And it's, it's seamless. There are a few times where I can sort of guess where, what they did, having dabbled in the field myself, but it, it really is really highly credible. Now, I should maybe talk a little bit more about the hobbits. Frodo himself, I imagine he lost his beloved cat in between scenes because he spends most of this looking like he's going to bawl his eyes out. And it does get a little tiring to look at. And it's not that Elijah Wood isn't a good actor. I never thought I'd say those words. I, I don't know, I guess it's the direction. It's, it's, I kind of get what they were going for. It's that it's so much bigger than anything he imagined because it's the first time he leaves the, I think they call it the Shire, which is the particular part of where, of, of the Hobbit villages where they live. Frodo and his cousins and his gardener, who are the four hobbits we follow for much of this. And yeah, he's, he's overwhelmed with fear, of course. I just wish there was a little bit more. 
I think it works better when he gets to say something than when he's just trying to is trying to emote with his face. Because when he actually gets to say something, you can tell that there's a sort of a quarrel within he he man, now I'm starting to talk old English. He part of him really wants to give up and say, I can't do I'm I'm just a hobbit. I'm I'm not made for this. But at the same time he feels like he has to. He is the only real hope. And you you can real that really comes across when he gets dialogue. Now the other big thing about the Hobbits is that they're the comic relief. They are kind of bumbling, they're short, they tend to be cowardly, some of them are downright stupid, and that's basically the comic relief. And the comic relief gets downright, we're talking 80s levels of magnitude of comic relief to where the point to the point where you just really want them to shut up at times. It's it's not Jar Jar Binks. Thankfully, but it's it's maybe also worth taking into account. This movie is 160 minutes, not counting the end credits, roughly. And considering that, there is of course about the same amount of comic relief as in an 80s movie that's only maybe 90 minutes long because it is so much longer. It's almost twice the length of, yeah, as you can tell from doing the math. And as such, yeah, it gets, I find it to get pretty grating. I, did, I realized this was made for, you know, it's, I don't know if it's technically a children's book, but it's, it's made to also be so that children can read it and watch these movies. They're, they're like PG-13, and Peter Jackson pushes it as far as, far as he can. I, f I feel like he, he probably found, felt like, you know, bound on hands and feet, considering the, the movies he used to do. And yes, I know it was his idea to direct them. And the... Part of what I, I will say, I kind of understand why the comic relief is so, I guess you could call it aggressive. And I, as far as I recall, this is only my second viewing of these movies. I believe it's really mainly this first one where it is like that. And it is because this is the beginning and we're going darker places in the next two movies. It's kind of not getting too dark too soon. And on that, this opens with a nice, concise backstory, which I'm not going to detail. The movie does much better than I would, where we, we learn the stakes. We find out how important the Ring of Power is. And the... Yeah, it, it really lets you know where it's overall going, and without it you'd be pretty lost, I guess, unless you read the book. Which is also something I really want to bring forth. I mean, I, again, I did do research on this viewing. The first viewing, I went in blind, and I had no trouble, really, following all three of these movies, so that's a big plus. This is you know, a genre that is not that kind to the uninitiated. It, it depends on the movie, of course, but... Anyway, after this concise opening, the movie goes to a much slower pace and maintains that for basically the entire movie. Where... I, again, I, I imagine it's too not throw everything at us at once. It, it does get very big in this movie. It's still an epic film, but it's not so... It's not the biggest it's going to get, of course, and it, it takes its time getting there. It, it lets us adjust to what we're learning and 
all these new races and such. Anyway, the, it, it slows down its pace and then it spends some time developing the four hobbits that we're going to be following and their village and, and their people in general to the point where you realize not only that Frodo is an image of innocence, he is just pure. You realize that and that you, and you get a real sense of what he's leaving behind, what he came from. So when you see him with that constantly frozen expression of endless dread, you understand why. You, you know, you think back to earlier in the movie and you're like, man, just a week ago the, the guy was partying and having fun with, like, you know, celebrating his uncle's... Um, crap, I'm, I'm no good with the family. His relative's birthday and just not a care in the world and now look at him. And it does really well with that really gets you a... That, that's where the, the scope kind of comes in. It starts in the really small and then gets really big. And that also ensures that we will not be overwhelmed. Now, it's also very much a... You know, it's, it's, that's one of the themes. We have the unlikely hero, because Frodo is very much the overall hero. He's, he's not the only hero and the, or the only lead, but it is very much, it's made clear that it, it really does very much come down to him. And it's, you know, and, and, and then you have that of, of this, this, this hero emerging from the unlikely place and where he never thought that he would actually be important and suddenly he is involved in this thing and, and, and he has to make a stand. He, he is a good hobbit, good individual, and he wants to fight for what's right. He just didn't think that he would be able to. He, he comes from such small beginnings. Now, as I understand through the research, this, in adapting this massive novel, it of course has to change some things. Now, as far as I could tell, this was the one that has the least changes of these three, and it's, as far as I understand, also the most accurate adaptation, excuse me, of the at least in the film medium, of the book, it's not the first, of course, to, to fit it all in, or fit enough of it in, it compresses some time between events and combines or omits some characters. Now, the, among other themes, is the, the, Ring of Power is evil, and it is very much conveyed that it is alive. It is a corrupting influence, and this is something that's infinitely important because it is the central... I don't know if it's technically a MacGuffin, but yeah, it's, it's the main, you know, item that the, the good guys are trying to protect and figure out what to do with. And so it is very important that you feel that it is dangerous. And it, it's very much conveyed that a, something powerful which could be used as a tool and or a weapon, it will, it, it will lead to greed, paranoia and jealousy. And this is very nicely set up and very consistent throughout the movie to 
the point where you really do feel like it is vital that they deal with this thing. It is just, it, it, yeah, you, you really feel the, as, as I said earlier, the, the stakes of this. And that also is a, a good, you, know, you, you could read into it different way. Tolkien himself said that, the author of the novel, in case you didn't know, probably did, that it is not really supposed to be about the atomic bomb, and, and that in general the, it's not really just an analogy for something, but that you could read into it whatever you would, and you would very much see how it, it could be an atomic bomb, it could be various different things, and it, it is a good theme to go into, to explore whether, you know, I, I would personally say that everything requires handling with you know, respect and integrity. You, you can't, there's nothing you can use that will never have any consequence to misuse. Other themes that explored here are those of hope, love, loss, sacrifice. It really gets around. It, and again, I did not think that I, I, I put off watching these movies for the longest time because I'm not into fantasy. And when I did watch them, I really found things to enjoy. And I would say that anyone who enjoys a good story and can at least live with the fact that there are things in this that you know, haven't been proven to exist in the real world, you're going to enjoy at least something in this. And it's going to be enough, I would say, to warrant at least, at least one viewing. Now, the... And, you know, of course, just go for the regular edition. I, I haven't watched the extended editions. The, those are obviously for the, you know, the hardcore fans. Every land presented in this is distinct and credible. You really feel like they, they go to very different places. It doesn't feel like they're just, you know, going around in the same little area. It, it really feels very different and you, you know, you, you see these other cultures, various cultures, and really get a sense of what they, what they're like, and yeah, just sort of uh, these, you know, that ma many different cultures are presented, and it doesn't do that much to sort of choose between. Like, there, there are ones that are very obviously evil. The orcs are definitely evil, but most of the rest are really seen as just, you know, just different ways to be. And obviously these different races are double for different classes, ethnicities, and the like. And, and it's quite inoffensive. That a little judgment is passed, but it's mostly on, you know, negative human traits, again, like greed. And, and so, yeah, it, it shows us more of the world, and you can kind of tell what it's like that actually exists in the real world. The, you know, the, the hobbits are very much farmers, and these sort of lower class kind of people, and yeah, there, there are various ones, I'm not going to go into every single one. Now, the... It's a very gripping movie, and at times rather tense. In, in spite of its slow pace, its gradual build-up, you really get into it, and you, you tend to feel what the characters feel. And, and every character has an arc, and has something to do. There, there aren't any that are just in there because someone, you know, the, 
Tolkien or Jackson wanted to put, you know, an, an elven archer in there, or a dwarf, or something. No, they all have a point to being there. Now, as such, there is not an awful lot of action, you know, given the pace, but when it is there, it's fast, and it has, it's, it's well choreographed, and it's a good balance between being chaotic and allowing you to follow what is going on. I would describe it as you, when you're watching the scene, you don't really have any trouble telling where everyone is and who's winning the battle. But after the action scene, and also, in spite of there not being an awful lot, it is great. It's really highly exciting and there are some really standout fights where you're really gonna, you know, be talking about them afterwards and, you know, you'd, you'd re-watch the movie, you know, looking forward to the action scenes also. But, but yeah, it's, after, after the scene is over, you may not be able to recount the entire thing because it was so fast and it was so kind of chaotic. And that, I think, is a really good way to do it, because this, at the end of the day, this is an entertaining movie. It's, it's also a movie that makes you think, but it's, it's a story, it's an adventure, so it's not about, you know, it, it's not Saving Private Ryan, it's not trying to be about the horrors of war, although it is, I would argue, a pacifist movie, a pacifist trilogy, war is kind of the necessary evil. It's when you're backed into a corner and you have to fight back, you make that decision and you try to avoid too many casualties. Now, the there is a lot of exposition in this and that's that happens with a lot of novel adaptations because novels <laughs> Novels can kind of get away with a lot of exposition. It's all there on the page, and they have to paint this world for you. And then when that's translated into moving pictures, some of that can't be communicated through moving pictures, or at least not very easily, so you have to have a character just say, well, this is that, and such. And it, it kind of, it avoids monologues, or it, inner monologues, but in place you kind of sometimes have characters just saying what you're supposed to be inferring from something else, or that, something you need to know, at least, without it really being a dialogue. Sometimes they're even by themselves when they're doing it, so, yeah. Now, the, the cinematography is fantastic. We have this great, these great sweeping shots to establish the various, you know, locations, particularly Mordor, which is where the, you know, the Dark Lord Sauron once reigned, and it is this nasty, dark, dark red, fiery, really unpleasant, uninviting place, and yeah, these, these big sweeping shots are very effective at very quickly establishing what a place is like and, yeah, giving us something to react to, giving us a sense of, kind of, yeah, of, of the place. And it tends to do well at not spending too long setting stuff like that up because there are a lot of places visited over the course of this film. I believe that pretty well covers it. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.